So when I first started doing this series, The FTSE Show, which was now 24 episodes ago, uh, we were getting about 10 to 15 likes per video. And I put out a request at the beginning of the videos for quite a while. If you've been watching the series, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, where I was asking for people to like the videos because we were getting close to hitting 20 likes a video. And we hit 20 likes. So I carried on asking for more likes. And we started hitting 30 likes a video. I carried on. We started hitting 40 likes a video. I've stopped asking for likes. And now we're hitting 60, 70 likes a video. So I don't know whether or not to ask for you to like this video or not. Hey there guys, how's it going? Chris Chillingworth here. Welcome to the FTSE Show, uh, episode number 24. And today we're going to look at GlaxoSmithKline, a huge company uh, in the FTSE 100, pharmaceutical and biotech sector. Uh, most people have heard of this company and uh, I have... Yeah, I guess they would be a household name. I think most people would have heard of GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, they make a lot of household products as well, uh, or are behind a lot of household products. So most of us have got something in our home with their logo stamped on it on the back. Um, 6.9 million shares traded on a daily basis, roughly. And the stats say that in the last year, uh, last rolled in 12 months, if you will, that the uh, share price has gone up 7%. In the last two years, it's gone up 17%. In the last three years, it's only gone up 1%. In the last five years, up 4%. So certainly in the last year or two, we've seen some growth there. Uh, very interested to look at these numbers because this is a company that you would kind of hope are doing very, very well. Uh, very large company, but I'm not a big fan of pharmaceutical and biotech companies as an investment. Uh, they tend to spend a lot of money on research and development. That's profit that doesn't make it to the shareholders. And they have to do that to stay competitive. And as a result of that, I generally stay away from pharma companies. Uh, but there are, I know there are people watching this show that are very keen on this particular sector. So let's dive into the numbers and take a look. Okay, let's take a look at GlaxoSmithKline PLC. Epic code is GSK. They're in the FTSE 100, and these guys are obviously a pharmaceutical and biotech sector business. Um, so, taking a look at revenue, we've got some obvious revenue growth here, which is a great sign to see. Uh, we're looking at 2008. It got two point, sorry, 24.3 billion. Uh, by 2014, they were still kind of at that level, right? They'd had some, we'd seen a, a growth to 28.3, 28.3, 27.3. Then we saw a bit of a drop off down to 23 billion. And then it's definitely grown. We can see certainly in the last four years, we've gone to 27.8, 30, 30.8, and now 33.7. So this is a company that's still able to get out there and make more money than they did in the previous year. That means that uh, their, their business model is still you know, good. They're able to get out there and win more business. And that's a very good sign because we're looking for growth companies. Remember that I'm only interested in companies that are going to grow in share price and uh, grow in intrinsic value of themselves as well so that's a good sign that's a good starting point cost of sales has also been increasing but that's fine what we're interested in is how fast are they increasing relative to the revenue growth and we can generally tell that from the gross profit and the gross margin and as you can see here when we're talking about gross margin we're talking about the slice of the pie that GlaxoSmithKline are able to keep and that slice of the pie has reduced for sure, which uh, essentially tells us that the cost of sales has been growing faster than the revenue has been growing. Uh, and we can see here that uh, back in 2008 to about 2012, they were sitting at um, above 70%. And this is quite a, a consistent decline, really. You know, if we call this 74% and that's 74%, 72, 72, then 70. So we've got a consistent decline then in gross margin. Uh, from 2008 to 2012, from sort of 73s, 74s down to flat 70s. And then 2013, we've gone from 76 down to probably the high 65s, uh, sorry, the low 65s, high 64s. So we can see here that it's been gradual over the last 12 years, but there has been a gradual, consistent drop in the slice of the pie that GlaxoSmithKline have been able to keep. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a concern. That's things moving in the wrong direction. We want things going up. We don't want things going down. Certainly we don't want things going down inconsistently 
over the last 12 years because that tells us a picture. So whilst they're able to get, able to get out there and find more business every year, uh, the costs of sales, the cost of all that is rising faster than what they're able to get out there and find. So that's a bad sign. Um, looking at expenses, you could argue really um, expenses are about the same. They've been consistent, I would say. Uh, the average expenses per year is about 50% and in 2019 we're looking at 52% so it may have gone up slightly but consistently they've been sitting at about 50% a year and you couldn't really argue that that's going in any particular uh, direction up or down uh, because they've had these little spikes along the way as well which throws you off a little bit. Um, R&D or research and development has been consistently sitting at about 20% a year it's always been that way now, 20% a year, 20% of your gross profit being spent on R&D is, generally speaking, very high for any other company in any other sector. But when you're looking at pharmaceutical and biotech, this is typical. We tend to see very high R&D costs, as you'd probably expect in the biotech and pharmaceutical sector. And so that's not, not a big concern, really, for this business, because we know they've got to do that. But this is a partially why I'm not a big investor in pharmaceutical and biotech companies because 20% of their profits isn't going to their shareholders because they have to invest it into R&D to stay ahead of the game, to stay ahead of the curve. Any business that needs to spend 20% of its profits on something just to stay ahead generally means I'm probably not going to be an investor because I want companies that don't need to do that. And I've got plenty of companies that don't need to spend 20% of their profits on this sort of stuff to stay ahead and therefore that 20% ends up making its way to the shareholders which is far more favorable for me um, interest on debt is at a manageable level we've not got a big concern about that it is quite high but it's not to the point where I'd be really really concerned and then we could take a look at the net earnings of this business and they're okay they're not bad um, they've had a losing year in 2015 where they lost 2.2% which was uh, a big issue uh, and that was largely, by the looks of things, that's largely down to it. Certainly a spike in expenses that year and a spike in tax expenses of $2.1 that year. So that really hit them hard. Um, but you could quite easily argue that certainly over the last 12 years, they've consistently sat at about 14%. If we highlight all of these and look at the average uh, net earnings return we're looking at 12% a year which is okay that's not too bad any company making 12% consistently on a year by year basis is doing pretty well you couldn't argue that this was necessarily consistent we've had a losing year we've had a 4.5% year we've had highs of 17% years so it is a bit up and down um, but these aren't terrible results they're not awful looking at the balance sheet uh, we've got uh, 4.7 billion in cash We've got 5.9 billion in inventory. What I'm really interested in here is the total current liabilities against current assets. Uh, current liabilities come to 24, 24 billion. Uh, assets come to 19.4 billion. So liabilities are outweighing assets right now and have been for... Uh, probably the last four years by the looks of things so uh, that's you know a sign of things going in the wrong direction because they were at 1.7x so what that essentially means is that assets outweighed liabilities by one point by a factor of 1.7 and you can watch here as it's dropped down the current ratio has gone from 1.7 to 1.4 1.3 down to 1 saw a little bit of a climb and now it's gone down to sub 1 it's gone to 0 0.9 0 0.6 in the last two years 0.8 so that's generally, if we look at the whole picture there, that's a downward downward trend, right? From 1.7 down to 0 0.8 in terms of liabilities now outweighing assets after at one point being up as high as 1.7 times. So that's a concern. Um, if we look at the long-term debt of the business, what we do in here, and I say this in every single video I do essentially, but we're looking at the size of the debt relative to the company's earning power. I don't really care exactly how much the debt is as long as they can afford to pay it back based on how much they actually make. And at the moment, we're looking at 23.5 billion in long-term debt. Uh, looking at their earnings, we're looking at, you know, on a good year, they're looking at about 5 billion in earnings. And last year, it's 4.1 billion in earnings. Uh, that would take them 5.7 years to pay off. That's a bit high. 
Uh, I think they're biting off a little bit more than they can chew right now, but it's not at a level that would make me scream and run away. Uh, so it's just a bit, it's just a tad too high for me. Shared, uh, shareholder equity has seen a... Uh, now, one thing I was concerned, concerned with for a long time with GlaxoSmithKline was the shareholder equity. If we look here, we've seen a drop-off from 10.7 billion to 9.7, 8.8, 6.7, jumped up to 7.8, but then down to 4.9, then up to 8.8. .8. But we were seeing consistently lower figures here, minus the few spikes that we saw along the way, down to 3.6 billion, from 10.7 to 3.6 billion in shareholder equity. That's assets minus liabilities equals shareholder equity, essentially. And when it's dropped that far down, it's telling us essentially that our liabilities are getting to the point where they're almost outweighing assets. Uh, and they have been, you know, it's been a, a consistent trend down. But then in 2019, we've seen a huge spike up to 18.3 billion in equity. And that comes down largely to that when we look at the liability jump, we're looking at here, we're looking at the intangible assets that have gone from 17.2 billion to 30.9 billion we're looking at goodwill from 5.7 billion 10.5 billion so these are i'm not too keen on i'm not a big fan of you know intangible assets these are licenses rights trademarks that sort of thing patents probably uh for a company like glaxo smith Klein. they're not things you can hold they're intangible assets they're not inventory it's not cash it's not something you can turn to cash particularly easily um, so I'm not a big fan of that so when I see the big jump in uh, equity but I can see that that's down to intangible assets and probably a patent of some kind uh, that's not really something that I personally am a big investor in there are other people out there that would absolutely love this and they'll be they'll be all over it but for me this isn't something that I'm particularly interested in um, and then again, we've got this downward trend on the retained earnings from 6.3 billion to negative 6.4 billion by 2017. You know, that's a big concern. And then we've seen it rise over the last two years to negative 2.7 billion to positive 4.5 billion. So that's pretty cool that they've managed to get that back up again. But you'll notice we're still sitting at the same point we were back in 2008. So over the last 12 years, we've seen zero growth in retained earnings. Personally, that's not something that ticks my boxes. Looking at the return on shareholder equity, that's healthy. That's been do they've been doing pretty well on that. They're getting pretty solid return on the equity that they hold. So here's where I sit with this, with GlaxoSmithKline then, um, to kind of wrap this up. There are about 1,400 companies uh, across the London Stock Exchange, if we're counting the FTSE 100, the 250, the small cap, the fledgling, and the AIM index, the, the AIM market. So if you're taking all of those companies, we're going through every single one of these companies and looking for a particular criteria of financials that tick all my boxes, that show me that this is a company that are doing everything right that I would expect them to be doing, and then I would look at that company and I would say, is the price right? You know, do I want to get in at this particular price? Am I getting a decent return off the value of this company? Uh, and do I expect that share price to grow over the next 10 years? And if so, I'm in. Uh, with GlaxoSmithKline, they don't tick all my boxes, unfortunately. There's too many here that where they don't tick. Uh, just to kind of touch on those very quickly, we've got a declining gross margin, which if that continues and continues, which it has done over the last 12 years, so why wouldn't it? Uh, there's no reason to think that that gross margin won't continue to decrease. We're talking about the slice of the pie that they're keeping of the revenue it has been decreasing over the last 12 years consistently. Uh, if that continues, obviously they're just going to keep having, they're going to have more and more trouble keeping the profits and, and making the profits. Uh, when we look at net earnings, net earnings haven't really grown either. Back in 2008, they were sitting at 4.1 billion. They're sitting at 4.1 billion in 2019. Uh, 4.1 million, not to be bulked at. This is great profit, but when I'm I'm looking for a certain type of business, yeah, this is not a company that's particularly going to grow much. Uh, if they're just producing the same sort of numbers. We're also seeing a downward trend in terms of long-term debt. 
uh, and you can see here I mean it's consistently going in the wrong direction one thing I didn't touch on in the uh, earlier on in the video is the short-term debt as well short-term debt is debt that's got to be paid within the next year uh, look at this 1.3 billion in 2015 now 6.9 billion so you can add that on to the 23.5 billion and we could argue that GlaxoSmithKline have more debt than I'm comfortable with and that the current earnings power are going to take a while to be able to pay that off and you could argue they're biting off more than they can chew um, and then obviously the fact that retained earnings haven't gone anywhere either they've not been able to accumulate the retained earnings they're sitting at exactly the same amount in that pot as they had back in 2008 we're talking 12 years ago so not a terrible business don't get me wrong at all this is not a terrible business if you own shares in GlaxoSmithKline good luck to you uh, you know I hope that they do well but for me this is not a company I'm looking to get into right now let's take a look at the chart okay so we're essentially looking at a monthly chart here a pattern of what has been going on at GlaxoSmithKline each bar represents a month we're going all the way back from 2008 to present day uh, we can see here that in 2008 the share price was sitting at about 50 pounds a share now we're at 41 pounds a share so had you bought 12 years ago in 2008 or let's you know 2009 we could call it even if we'd bought down in 2009 when the prices were, were almost at their lowest you know and we got in at 36 pounds a share we're now sitting at 41 pound a share and you can see here this is nothing to do with the 2020 crash because they were at this level as recently as August and September 2019 so they've returned back to their August September levels of last year for me that's not enough growth I'm looking for a growth company I'm looking for a company that I can invest in for five ten years uh, whose share price will grow from let's say three to thirty pounds a share and there's a certain criteria that the financials have to be showing for that to happen this is this, this happens to companies that are growing quickly that are growing fast that are reinvesting their profits that aren't paying too much in dividends they're pumping their money back into the business so they can continue to grow that business for its shareholders that's what I'm looking for GlaxoSmithKline are not a terrible company this is a very profitable business don't get me wrong but they're not really going anywhere that share price isn't really going anywhere you could buy this at 40 40 pounds a share right now and in 20 years time it'll be worth 40 40 pounds maybe 50 pounds a share in 20 years time well that 10 pound a share profit over 20 years is not enough for me and so you know I'm not knocking GlaxoSmithKline as a terrible business they're really not a bad business but uh, they just they just don't take the boxes for what I'm particularly looking for, and so you know people will come onto this watch this show and they'll jump on the comments and say, "Ah, GlaxoSmithKline are an excellent company." Look, I'm not saying they're not. I'm saying they don't tick the boxes for what I'm particularly looking for, which is share price growth. And the charts show us that when you don't tick the boxes financially, which they haven't done, we've just gone through the numbers. You can see here that it correlates when you do not have the numbers when you do not tick the boxes that I'm particularly looking for the charts reflect uh, a 12 year trend of gross margin going in the wrong direction it shows retained earnings not going anywhere over the last 12 years you know the share price reflects that in so much that it really hasn't gone anywhere and so this is the reason why I'm not investing in GlaxoSmithKline okay so I want to start by saying I'm not a hater of GSK at all uh, we've seen their numbers we've seen that they are profitable they are making some big big profits for their shareholders uh, they have some ups and downs along the way you know some negative years uh, but generally speaking they're making good net earnings on a yearly basis despite pumping 20% into you know R&D every year uh, and, and despite a few other little things but there are some concerns there for me this is a company that doesn't really seem to be uh, growing particularly fast and this is the problem sometimes with some of the big companies the big big corporate businesses because they've already done a big chunk of their growing already and when I'm looking for a company that I can pick up for today you know at 5, 10, 15 pounds a share uh, that are going to be worth 
50 60 pounds a share in five ten years time maybe 20 years time you know that's the kind of company i'm looking for and generally speaking if you're looking for that kind of company you generally want to see certain types of uh culture certain types of results in their financials but but more in terms of their what they're doing with their profits you know you want to see that they're making profits that they're able to make more profits each year that they're growing as a business but we also want to see what are they doing with that money are they pumping it all out on dividends? Are they reinvesting it somehow? If so, what is their what is their uh, technique, their strategy? Are they buying more assets to grow the business? Are they pumping it all into retained earnings and acquiring other businesses and growing in that sense? Um, and that is what's fascinating to me. And that's what I'm looking for. And GlaxoSmithKline just really aren't doing that. And so, yes, a solid business, possibly a good dividend. I didn't check the dividend. Um I would expect a decent dividend out of GlaxoSmithKline. But in terms of share price growth, it's not really we've not really seen that. And again, when we look at the stats that we looked at at the very beginning of the show, in the last five years, that share price has only grown by 4%. Now, if I'm owning a stock for five years and I've only got five, 4% growth out of it, I'm not particularly pleased by that. So um, not bad. Not a bad company, but just not ticking the boxes as a growth stock, as a company that are going to be much higher in 10, 15 years. Um, so it's time to get them up on the board. And again, you know, I see this all the time. When I'm not happy about a company and I really don't like them, they score badly. When they tick all the boxes and I get really excited about them, they score really well, like Taylor Wimpy, like DGE. Uh, when I'm kind of like, meh, about a company... They tend to sit in the middle and, you know, I, I guess that's me becoming tuned to what I'm looking for and the scoring algorithm has been designed and built around that. So it should reflect it. It should match. Um, GSK, they score a very underwhelming and this is going to shock some people, I think, because I think a lot of people would think DG, uh, GSK would uh, score a lot higher than this, but they score a very mediocre 18 points. Which puts them 12th place under BT. So, um, yeah, I would say that's probably right. I, I'd probably expect them to be a little bit higher than that. Uh, and this can, the sort of things that can harm these companies could be, you know, a downward trend when BP had a flat trend, you know. Uh, little things like that that can knock off a few points and we're only talking a couple of points that's literally a few percent here and there on the scoring algorithm so you know i think that's fair i honestly do think that is a fair score for gsk they're not a company i would be interested in investing in like i say if you've got a different agenda or a different focus then sure you're going to value these companies in different ways but for me gsk are not the sort of company that i'm looking for and unfortunately on my leaderboard they sit at 12th place so let's get them up on the board okay so that's gsk up on the board listen this is a company that's better than bp it's it's better than tesco it's better than vodafone it's better than centrica uh it's better than rolls royce it's better than dixon's it's uh better than royal mail national grid tate and lyle um, it's better than easyjet uh it's just not good enough unfortunately thank you so much for watching guys and i'll see you guys in the next episode cheers